Hello, everybody. Welcome to IndieCade 2019. This is the pre-show to the awards, which they are testing in the background, as you may be able to hear. Uh, I am Ian Hink from Easy Allies, and I am joined here by some devs who I assume are nominated. <laughs> Introduce yourselves and tell me what game you have nominated. Um, my name is Marcy Campos. I'm Jesse V. Hill. And I am Sean Bloom, and we're here with AR Box, which is an augmented reality powered escape room in a box. I remember, I remember now, I think I saw you guys at E3, and I'm still, I really want to stream this with Easy Allies because I think it would be a lot of fun. Uh, AR Box. So, yeah, it's an augmented reality escape room that you can set up in any room, and you use your phone with it. How does it work? Um, so basically, we you use your phone, um, so all the objects that come in the box, cool posters, mysterious cards, a glowing gem, interact with the phone. So the phone uses AR to kind of track and change the objects in the real space. Um, uh, yeah, and so then the box is reusable, is the thing that we really like about it. So uh, in a month, an update might get pushed to your phone, and the, the objects come out, and you get to use them in a new way. Like, so you might have used them before to solve some kind of puzzle. The next time around, like, you're, you're spell casting. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, just a big feature that we've added since you saw it at E3 is that it's now integrated with your smart home. So uh, you can set it up with your, your smart lights and it'll create atmosphere while you're playing the game. No way. <laughs> That's very cool. I'll have to get the smart things at my house to work again with my <laughs> Samsung phone. It got all weird. But uh, yeah, that all sounds really cool and I love... I mean, that's the power of augmented reality is you can just push an update and then the box is a whole new game. Exactly. Very, very cool. What, uh, what awards are you nominated for? Do you know? I know some pe sometimes people don't even know. Uh, yeah, okay, so Indicate is cool in a way because we're nominees, but we don't really know what we're nominated for, and so they don't really work like the Oscars where they normally read a list of, like, here are the five nominees. Uh, we know we're nominated. Um, we are, we, we're also nominated for a Spotlight Award. There's a new thing at Indicate this year where certain categories are being sort of spotlighted for, like, I think vocal performance is one, and then, like, location-based and immersive, so we're also definitely nominated for that. Do you have voice acting in yours? Uh, for the immersive and location-based. But we do have voice acting. Uh, we do have voice acting. That's cool. Um, well, I don't see the next people, so we can just keep vamping if you guys want. So what, what inspired you guys to make AR Box? I haven't heard from you in a while. Yeah. So uh, this project actually started as a game jam uh, that we did about a year ago uh, that was specifically like we wanted to create something augmented reality, which none of us had done before. But all of us really appreciate sort of the physicality of uh, environments and escape rooms and things like that. So when we took the idea of like, we want to make an AR game, of course we made a full physical escape room uh, that was AR sort of like augmented. Um, and then in the years since then, we've sort of been shrinking it down and putting it into this box, smoothing all of the pieces out and, uh, and, and creating something really cool. Yeah, I was just handing it off to you. <laughs> it's the this is the downside of only having one microphone is we have to kind of pay, play hot potato. Um, so does it have? Because I've done a few escape rooms and there's always like a light story element. I assume you guys have that going too. Did you find? Do you find it harder to come up with new story stuff or new tech stuff with? I mean, I it's not always all the way out yet, right? So you haven't had to push updates yet. But like, where where were the un, unsuspected challenges? I guess. Um, basically, uh, I think it's it's honestly the story informs the uh, the sorry the just the story informs the um, the story informs the puzzles. There we go. Um, and so like what you start to see about all the objects, you're like, what can this be? If it's this in the narrative, then all of a sudden you know understand like how could this be mysteriously enchanted to you know be a sinister plot point? And I think that's kind of where you want to design from. Very cool. Uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, no, I'll just say, like, so we've built this custom piece of tech that uh, is this Internet of Things device that interacts, like, both with your smart home and then with the rest of the game. And we are done with that. Like, we're not going to touch it anymore. Like, this is my, like, 
I have done with custom peripherals for a little while. It works. It's fine. And I swear to <laughs> up there and to my partners that we're not touching that anymore. So now it's just story. <laughs> Well, I feel like oh. I do want to say like so we've been working on this for a year and this is the fourth or fifth like different scenario that we've created and writing the story and creating the puzzles really goes hand in hand each time that we've done something and shown it and learned from it and then sort of uh, gone back and, and written a new scenario the puzzles change because the story context is different and the story context sort of has to be driven by what the players are actually doing. Love to hear that. Well, you guys are being called up there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we will let you guys go, but thank you so much for talking with us here. AR box. We'll see if they win anything in a minute. <laughs> Best of luck. Thank, thank you so you much. Uh, you guys can just go on this way and I'll keep vamping. I'll just keep talking for the camera and wondering if anyone else is coming up onto the stream next. <laughs> so hey, we've got a big group of five coming up, so I think we'll just do it standing. And then uh, I'm gonna keep working on the sink. Actually, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna do this. So yeah, here we go. Alrighty, come on up everybody. Thank you so much. Whoa, thank you. Woo. Yeah, everybody just stand. Big group today. No, you guys to stand in the front, right, I think? Yes. Big group today. All right, I'm going to give you all the mic, and you can introduce yourselves. I'm Sean Alexander Allen. <laughs> Brian Carr. Hey, I'm Brian Chung. Hi, I'm GJ Lee. Hey, I'm Chris Algu. All right, and what are you guys here for? And just give it to Mike. What are you here? Uh, here uh, we're getting a. Uh, we run the games, uh, the Game Devs of Color Expo, and we are getting the Game Changer Award tonight. So that's basically I have a newborn kid, so this is literally the only reason why I'm here. <laughs> well, that's what we're all here for. This is uh, the team. Of five of us on the team. There's six organizers. Uh, not present here is Cat's Ball. Could you tell me tell uh, tell us a bit about what you've done before coming here? Like what what why did you get this award? Like what what is your work more currently? Anyone of you? Sure. Yeah, so the Game Devs of Color Expo is an annual event we run in New York City that highlights games made by people of color along with players of color, streamers, the whole thing. And so we've uh, tried to be as intersectional as possible and to create a event that really represented the sort of breadth of the broader gaming scene. And uh, maybe you will talk, how long have you guys been doing it for and what was the kind of, main, obviously the main drive is to create diversity in our industry, um, but was there something else, like what pushed you to decide to get into this? Let's see. We started about four years ago, is that right? It was yeah, a, a small... Year, next that, year. Yeah. Round table, yeah. Yeah, it started as a round table. It was uh, uh, with some um, developers in the local New York City area. And it started out as just conversations. And then we realized uh, Chris and Kat and some of the original, I guess, founders, they wanted to create it to be an event. And then it started growing. And our previous event that just happened was the biggest one yet. And we plan to grow even more. Yeah. Anyone else want to also, I just want to add, this is not just about creating diversity. This is showing awesome work by people that just get pushed out. I mean, like, the industry is just exclusionary by default. And that, like, we're just showing the good stuff that's out there. Like, it's like diversity is kind of a dumb term. Like, we're not trying to get that. We're just trying to show that there's a world of people making games out there and that they often just aren't at the PAXs, the game developers conferences because it's very hard. We also work very hard to try to get people who are making games or just talking about games from all over the world. Also, we go out of our way to make sure that they come. And we're not just in New York, we're in Harlem, which is very important. So we actually get a lot of people from Harlem who are like, what's this? And then they get to learn about like that there are people like them making games, which is another way of doing change. It's more about like changing the industry and less about just diversity. I can add to that. Um, yeah, and on top of that, the way we run things is really important about, as was mentioned, to be anti-exclusionary, to be more inclusive and accessible. So that's why we pay our speakers, uh, our devs show for free, we pay our volunteers and all our staff, and so on.
We That's also great. have we also paid for some people like our speakers to come to New York, but we also pay for some games that we were just like we need these games here, so we went out of our way to get people from like other countries to come to New York. Other continents. Yeah. Yeah, other continents, yeah. Well, I can ask I can ask you Brian, like do you have any examples of any games recently that you feel have been important to highlight? Um, yeah, uh, we've uh oops, sorry. Well, all right, there we go. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'm not uh, uh, as uh, versed in the in the games as uh, uh, my fellow organizers. Um, we've flown people out from uh, Canada, South Africa, Australia this year. Um, we're, we're bringing people in from everywhere. Uh, their games are important, and they need you know they need exposure. Maybe there isn't always an easy way for them to get exposure. We clear that path to make it easier for them to get exposure. After Hours is a game that's been blowing up all over the place, and it's by South African devs that we got that we flew out. They spoke. They showed their game. And then we took at least one of them out to see Sorry to Bother You, like, which had not opened internationally. And we were like, this is a movie about like anarchists, like anti-capitalists, like racism, all these things. And uh, Tim Flusk is that person. So they were like, yeah, like, let's go see that movie. Yeah. So that was also another thing, like, just let's go see a cool movie afterwards. <laughs> Just some game highlights. Yeah, I mean, yeah, um, yeah Hyperdot. Hyperdot Hyper is one. Skater Day for years. Skater Day is is uh, here also. Yeah. Oh, yeah cool. um, Time is also a nominee. Querying Space Time is also a nominee, and they showcased uh, this Swim past sanity. year. Yeah. Swim Sanity. Sarvat. Sarvat. Yeah. A lot of uh, good games coming out of the community that might not otherwise get as much attention or have a place to to be. Yeah, and there was one of those that was here right now, right? Um, yeah, there was Queering Space Time and Skate and Date. Um, yeah. Cat Small's uh, Sweetheart is, okay. is out here, and uh, yeah. Well, what, what kind of games are they? Oh. Well, Skater Day, I, I mean, I, I, play, I love Skater Day, I love Sweetheart. I didn't get to play Queering Space Time because that's a, it's a board game about like queer women, and it, it, a lot of, we got a lot of press coverage. People wrote about it because they stopped and they're like, what is this thing? There's a, a lot of pictures we have from it. Uh, but Skater Day is a game where you are like queer women that are in um, a roller derby, and you so you do the roller derby bit in like a rhythm game, and then there's a, a visual novel element to it where you're like, does she like me? Does she? Like, or you're trying to get the story to find this person that you want to date, and then uh, um, what was the other one? Uh, sweetheart, yeah, sweetheart. Okay, I personally I love Sweetheart so much. Uh, it's one of those games that we're actually seeing the narrative a lot of times where it's like uh, men or other masculine uh, presenting people will play this game and they feel something hardcore like because Sweetheart's about basically what it's like to be just a woman in the world. Uh, it's about it's kind of a semi-autobiographical game about cats life going to school and working at a tech company and just it has a very simple you get dressed you feel a certain way based on how you got dressed like do you feel confident do you feel like you're dressed too sexy then you leave and then the world basically reacts to you and then you react to the world and it's like kind of trying to keep your confidence up while dealing with am i the bad guy to other people like if someone harassed me on the street was it my fault it's like very very like experience of being a woman or a femme in this world essentially and it just everybody who writes about it just talks about how it basically deeply affected and i feel very much the same way and we were very lucky that you know cat is one of the founders of the is she's like like the core of the expo and then also gave a really good talk about it at our expo I'll give a special shout out to Pre-Shave uh, by Sam, oh, yeah. which is um, it's kind of a game that where it's an autobiographical game where you see the uh, an image of the Dilip herself, and it's kind of like this physics kind of experience where um, it's basically about an experience as like a hairy brown man, and it has a lot to do with body image, and it's basically a simulator where you sort of shave yourself, and unfortunately that couldn't be here at Indicade, right, but right. yeah. Cool. You want to swap back out? Yeah, I want to swap over. over. Thank you so much, guys. Oh, Thank you. and he's leaving again. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Do you want to have a final word? Do you want to have anything? Final, a final word. That all sounded really cool. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we're going to bring in the next person now. Sync is as good as we can get it. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Carpenter, uh, let me zoom myself back in, and we'll bring in the next guest. Come on up. We'll be in the middle. How's that sound? Yeah.
Boom! I You told me about your game earlier today, if yes, I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It looked very cool. Tell us about it and introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, I'm Zen. I am a filmmaker, game designer, media producer. I'm here with a game called Shasin. Uh, it's a political strategy game for three to five players where everyone's a politician in the middle of a pol uh, election campaign. Uh, players must uh, 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 pick opinions on political and ethical uh, issues, uh, earn resources, uh, capture areas, gerrymander opponents, hatch conspiracies, dodge headlines in a pursuit to become the president. And you, uh, you, you had, a, you did a few test cards on me, uh -huh. and they were pretty, they were pretty interesting questions because they're very like, here's a big political statement, yes or no, and then if you guess if or if whatever you say your opinion, you get different points. Like, what were they? Tr let me see if I can remember. Trust, clout, uh -huh. uh, media uh -huh. presence, and uh, funding. Yeah, campaign funds. Yeah. Boom. So yeah, based on your answer, you get a different amount of different things, and then that increases what kind of politician you are, I guess? Uh, so the resources you earn and the answers you give uh, contribute to your platform and uh, build your ideology. As you build your ideology, you unlock new powers, exciting moves that you can pull on your opponents, uh, and you come into yourself as a politician. <laughs> it's very cool, and it felt, just even f just seeing it for just a second, it felt very like prescient I guess very like of this moment yeah. and uh, I don't know it's a powerful board game because even just like I didn't even play it but just having you show it to me I was like oh man this could get really <laughs> intense especially if you have like if everyone playing doesn't agree yeah. politically like in real life and I mean I'm sure you could like mm -hmm. just play a different person than your own beliefs too yeah Did, have you gotten into interesting situations in play testing so uh uh, very uh, many, uh, many players play by their actual beliefs, but very often we find players role playing the exact I opposite ideology that they come from. Yeah. And sometimes, when I'm lucky to witness it, I find players who friends who thought they were ideologically similar play the game and realize, wait, you actually believe that? Yeah. <laughs> How could you? <laughs> so, so you've made. So not since diplomacy has a game so keenly just ripped friendships apart. I love it. Uh, it, I think it rips friendship apart with the with the sole purpose of getting them back together. Yeah. To Building understand, it up. like it up. you know, you can't have a political conversation at a dinner table without plates being thrown at each other. Right. <laughs> this puts you in a safe space. You can at the end of it say, "I did it for the game," and walk away. Right. Right. And have political conversation. It's very important, not only in the U.S., not only in India, around the world. Politics has not been in more dire straits. Yeah. Well, and it's and it's such like a, uh, a a taboo issue a lot of the time to discuss it. Uh -huh. So having this kind of vehicle mm -hmm. to facilitate those uh -huh. conversations is really great. Um, I think it's hard to tell. There are people lining up, but it's hard to tell if they're supposed to come on next <laughs> or if we should keep talking to each other. That's your call, entirely. Yeah, I don't know. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then uh, tell us again. Uh, how can people? Like, see this game? Can they pre-order it? Uh, tell us what, what to do. So we ran a Kickstarter early this year, which went really well. Uh, we're still open for pre-orders on Backerkit. So it's buyshasen.com. That's B-U-Y-S-H-A-S-N.com. Okay. S-A-H-E-N? S-H-A-S-N. E-S-N. E -S -N. Okay. S-H-A-S-N. Okay, okay, okay. Shasen. Yeah. Great. Shasen. Sash Sash <laughs> now I'm all confused. <laughs> Sashin? Yeah. Yeah, it looks really cool. Like, visually, the art is really very cool. Check it out. Uh, Buy Sashin.com. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's bring in the next people. Hang on. Are you next? If you are wanting to be on this, you're next. I, yeah, I was told to come here. Great. Come on up. We can sit on whichever chair we want. My name's Ian. How are you? Good. My name's Samantha. Samantha. Tell us about the game you've brought to Indicade. Sure. Hi, I'm Samantha Gorman. I'm the co-founder of Tender Claws, and we're here with The Under Presents, which is part immersive theater, part VR game. 
Um, it's the full game is about is uh, coming out this year. Right now, we're doing a little bit of a taste, um, and we have a live actor off state offset as people are gonna explore the hub world, uh, the vaudeville stage where part of the game takes place. So it takes place. It's a vaudeville kind of setting. In the past, or modern day, or in the 30s, or uh, so it's it's more of a story. It's a fiction. It's a story that about inter two intersecting worlds. One is like a hub world called the Under, which is a vaudeville stage, and the main um, single player part of it is the story of a doomed research vessel that you can follow the characters around on. A doomed research vessel? That sounds really cool. How do they, well, without spoiling anything, how do they sort of, or what was the, the impetus for the idea of trying to link these two stories? Like, how do they link together? Yeah. So the under, which is the vaudeville stage area, is sort of a, curated by this mysterious MC. And he grabs random uh, lost souls and voyages throughout time and then brings up, up, them up on the stage to perform for you. And uh, a lot of the acts we already have are actual real-life performance artists from the downtown theater um, scene in New York that we worked with to recreate their performances in VR. That's very cool. Um, yeah, and uh, so the research vessel is one of the stories that goes on stage, and then you learn that it's actually a whole expanded larger game. Very cool. So you said, and maybe I misunderstood, but you said it's a VR thing, but there's also a live actor interacting with the player at the same time? How does that work? How does that interplay happen? So we created actually Raptors essentially. So uh, for part of the run of the game, it can be downloaded for Unquest. We're going to have uh, live actors at different hours coming in and out of the game and possessing uh, NPC characters. That's super cool. I really like that idea. I've not heard of anyone doing anything like that yet so far. Uh, unless there are, and then I got to play those too because this sounds amazing. Uh, do you know when people can play it? You said later this year. Yes, it will be out later this year. And on Quest. On Quest. Okay. <laughs> this is very cool. Uh, remind us the name one more time. It's called The Under Presents. The Under Presents. Very very cool. I got to check this out. I missed this when I was looking around. I, I didn't yeah, see it. A way it, we we're in a like a glass room. Okay past the board games so I went in there but it, not everything was set up yet earlier today this is the first day kind of of the of the show so I was not everything was ready yet oh, I'm bummed I missed this I'll have to try to see it tomorrow if you're coming to Indicade you can see all of these things so if you're in the area it's at Santa Monica College you should come and try all this stuff out because it's very cool uh, well good luck in the awards tonight Hopefully it goes well for everyone. I don't know. <laughs> I want everyone to win. So yeah. Uh, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll see who's up next in our weird little pre-show here. Um, that sounded really, really cool. Live actors in VR with people. Let's see. Let's see. Are you guys gonna? Are you guys supposed to be on the live stream? I am. I don't th I don't Come on up. Later, but I can donate. Let's go now. Okay. I haven't seen a schedule and no one's here helping, so we're just going to go however it goes. Excellent. Henry, I see. Yes, I'm Henry Smith. Henry Smith, tell us about your game or experience. Uh, so I'm, I'm a developer from Montreal, Canada, and I was actually at IndieCade uh, several years ago with my game Space Team. Oh, yeah, I love Space Team. Okay, great, yeah, you made Space, yes, team? made Space Team? That's dope. Space Team is amazing. My sister loves Space Team and the card game version. Oh, thank you. She, she changed the version to uh, that you play it across an entire room, the uh, card game. You had to okay. run back and forth. Amazing. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, people have come up with all sorts of interesting ways to play that I never anticipated. So anyway, this year I am here with, uh, with a follow-up of sorts. It's a, it's a similar setup. It's called Blabyrinth, and it's a cooperative escape room that you play on mobile devices with people in the same room and the levels are procedurally generated. So every time you play, the puzzles are different, the clues are different, uh, the layout is different, the scenery is different, everything is different. And so it's a different experience every time. That sounds very cool. And so how does, does everyone have their own phone, like Space Team? Okay. Walk us through just like how, how the gameplay sort of goes with Blabyrinth. Well, you all, you all start in a waiting room of sorts and introduce yourself to each other and you get assigned a random character 
and then the game begins and you're dropped into a level and you can each person sees one room of the labyrinth on their screen and you can you can go northeast southwest sort of feels like a zelda dungeon yeah but non-violent uh just puzzles and you find cryptic clues and secret passages and you have to help each other perform elaborate rituals and maybe you all have to push something at the same time and there's a hidden object underneath and it's a key and someone else found a, a door and so you need to go and unlock it and maybe you get trapped and I have to come rescue you. So there's a lot of working together and uh, solving puzzles and sharing information. And yeah, it takes 10, 15 minutes, two to four players. It's uh, That sounds awesome. Yeah, that sounds really awesome. So you've got like buttons that you can use on e each person's phone. It's not just, because the name Blabyrinth, I was thinking it's like talking based mostly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in the, in the same similar way to Space Team, you're, you're, in, you're in the same room and you have to talk to each other to share information about what you found because you see different things. Um, and uh, and it's, there's no control panel like Space Team. You, you see like a top down view of the level and the, there are items you can pick up and scenery that you can interact with. Um, so sometimes there are switches and buttons like on the wall or the floor and they'll change part of the level or unlock a chest and so you have to figure out how the level works and it's sort of a big, it's a big escape room basically and so you have to find the locks and keys and codes and interact with the level to, to get out and find the treasure. So the one part of Space Team that maybe, maybe is present here but is always like the big crazy driving factor is a time time crisis happening right. is that happening here do you have a time limit or so it's interesting I, I'm still kind of uh, figuring out exactly the best way to organize it I do have a timer that counts up right now I used to count down I decided to change to count up um, so at the moment you you don't lose the game when the time runs out you 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 just don't get uh, like a bonus uh, for oh, finishing okay. on finishing under a certain amount of time. A little less stressful then. Yeah. than <laughs> So I wanted to be the idea was that it was like Space Team but with less shouting, and so I wanted to make it a little bit less stressful. Uh, but I still want to have uh, I still want to have some sense of urgency so that it feels like an escape room and also so that people who want more of a challenge uh, have something to compete against. So I so I, I want to keep the base game very accessible, but also have something for for people who want more. This sounds very very cool. Blabyrinth. Blabyrinth. Yeah. When can people get it, and on what phones? So I, it's it's not quite ready yet. I I think it's going to take a few more months. Um, but I'm going to start public beta testing soon because I need a lot of feedback. But a procedural game like this, there are an infinite number of bugs that can develop yeah. spontaneously. So I'm going to need help fixing them. And uh, so in a few weeks, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch a public beta uh, uh, on my mailing list and, and through my social media. And so people can sign up for that and, and play. And then uh, hopefully early next year, I'll have version one. But it's the kind of game that I, I think uh, will be expanded as well and I'll add new things, new content, new levels, maybe some bespoke levels from escape room designers. If you're an escape room designer and you're listening to this uh, and you're interested in perhaps creating a custom level for my game with more of a narrative, unlike the random levels that exist in the game right now. I'd be interested to talk to you, so reach out. My friend Jason would probably love to talk to you about that. He's made, a dis he's made an escape room before. Excellent. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, Blabyrinth sounds very cool. Sounds like something if we could figure out a way to sh uh, stream it. Easy Allies would love to <laughs> figure that out. It's, it's, I, I think it's pretty difficult to stream a multiplayer mobile game. Yeah. I don't know who, or just put phones, that. but then you don't want other people to see like, it. Where everyone wears a GoPro camera on their yeah. head and stuff. That's that seems cool. hard. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. If, if anyone has any good ideas for streaming this kind of game, I'd also love to hear those. Uh, yeah. But I, I, don't, I don't know much about streaming myself because, because uh, yeah, I mostly do mobile stuff. Uh, and there's, there's starting to be some ways to stream individual mobile, like single player mobile games, but multiplayer, local multiplayer games, much harder, I think. Yeah, so, for sure. so yeah, it's going to be a bit awkward, uh, but um, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's some way it can work. Uh, if, if people, if people want to do it, they'll find a way. That's usually how the internet works these days. Yeah. <laughs> well, we could see if we could find a way, but thank you so much. Blabyrinth sounds very cool. Thanks thank you. All right, uh, we'll bring on the next person. What? Great. Okay. Whoever needs to go next, let's go next. We're just, we're flying by the seat of our pants here, chat. This light got knocked. Let me fix that. Let's just mix it up. I'll be here, and you guys can be on either side of me, and that way I can point... 
Sounds good. Here comes the light guy. He's going to fix the lights for the stage up there. You can't see this chat, but he's standing on a box, and it's very precarious. All right, anyway. Uh, wait, come come this way, okay. and then I'll, I'll be able to mic everyone at the... This is a busted chair. This chair is very weird. All right. Uh, hi. Hello. Tell me your names, and then explain the game that you are here with. Uh, my name's Marlo Doby. Marlo Doby. I'm Terry Kavanagh. Terry Kavanagh. I know that name, I think. <laughs> what uh, game are you guys here with? Uh, we're here with Dicey Dungeons. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we're here with D Dicey Dungeons. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a deck building roguelike with dice, is the basic spiel. A dice builder. Yeah, a dice builder. Well, how have we never said that? Yeah. You're welcome. You can use that for free. Uh, I actually saw a little bit of this earlier, so it looked like there were... Explain how it works. Who wants to explain how it works? Uh, okay, so um, it is a deck-building roguelike, um, kind of a modern genre, very inspired by Dream Quest, which uh, is one of my favorite video games. Um, basically, uh, you play as a different one of six different characters, uh, you uh, fight monsters in a dungeon, you level up. Um, it has mechanics that are like deck building roguelikes, but which are more, uh, well, it uses dice instead. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? Sort of. So are you rolling the dice? Are the dice like your stats? Like uh, how is it? So uh, every turn, basically, you are drawing cards that are your equipment, and you are rolling dice and assigning those dice number values to your equipment. So it's like, oh, if I roll a six, this does six damage. And some of them need higher numbers, and some of them need lower numbers, and some of them do status effects, and there's variety in all of that. And you said it's a roguelike, yeah. right? So does it have a story that you're going through, or is it just kind of like, get as far as you can in this dungeon and then die? Uh, yeah, it's got a story. Um, so the game is basically a game show. Uh, the six characters you can play as are uh, humans who have decided to take part in this game show to win their heart's desire. I did not expect the game show angle. Yeah, it's, it's a bit different. <laughs> um, it's hosted by uh, Lady Luck, the literal goddess of fortune. And um, yeah, she transforms all the people who want to be on a game show into dice. Uh, they have to win two challenges and spin the wheel at the end to win what they want to win and uh, yeah that's what the game's about very cool I like the, I like the story inspiration for the gameplay of the dice or whichever order it came in whatever did you did you pay for the licensing rights to uh, that song from guys and dolls about lady luck you know what I'm talking about missed opportunity missed opportunity yeah. get it in there <laughs> Um. When can people play it? Is it out? Is it not out? Is it ever coming out? Uh, it's out. It's out on Steam right now. It's been out for about a month and a half. It's on Steam right now. You can go and play it. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're hopefully going to do some ports. We're kind of still figuring that stuff out, but hopefully you should have something to say about that really soon once we nail down the details. But we want to do like a Switch board eventually. And Everybody loves stuff when it's on the Switch. Yeah. <laughs> That switch, I love that little switch. Uh, anything else that you want to say about Dicey Dungeons? Is it Dungeons or Dungeon? Dungeons, plural. More than one. Yeah, there's a lot of environments in the game. So. Good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just check it out. Is it hard? Uh, it is, I would say it has a really good difficulty ramp where the first like time you play with each character, it's really easy to get a hold of it, but we have a lot of challenge modes that can really amp up the difficulty. Okay, cool. Because like, I love games like this, but I'm not good at them. Like Slay the Spire or Darkest Dungeon, I always just lose real bad, like halfway <laughs> through, you know? Well, we really try to make it actually very approachable and accessible. And um, I've heard people say that it's a very good game to play if you're interested in the genre, but find them a bit alienating or difficult. Because ah. it's very, uh, I don't know, it's very bright and friendly, and all the information is on the screen at once. Um, in most games in this genre, you have a you have a deck, right? Right. And you're drawing cards from that. And um, if you're watching someone play, you don't know what half of the cards are. Uh, in Dice and Dungeons, it doesn't work like that. You, you kind of have a hand. Um, so everything that you have is on screen at once, and it's the same every round. Uh, for almost all the characters. Oh, cool. So in, in a lot of ways, it's just a lot easier to get your head around, especially at first. Um, it gets more complicated as it goes on, but... One hopes that it will, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I liked the style of it. It looked very cool. I just like pl watched somebody play it over their shoulder, so I didn't get to play it myself. But it looked very cool. Dicey Dungeons. I think we've got the next people ready to come up here. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, Best of luck tonight at the awards. Thank you. Uh, we will. You can go away now, and I will issue forth the next individuals. How's it going, chat? 20 minutes left? Okay. We're going to talk for a while. <laughs> okay. Two more? Okay, okay. We could talk for like, actually, that works pretty well when I was in the middle because then I could just mic everybody. Here we go. Hello. Hi. Tell us your names and the games. Uh, hi, I'm Carol Mertz, and I am the design, uh, one of the designers of Chroma and one of the designers of Hell Couch. Both are nominees this weekend. I've heard tell of this Hell Couch. <laughs> we were actually going to use the couch for this, but then they said that it was Hell Couch, and we were like, okay, well, no. Nah. And what, what about you? Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Kai. Uh, I am one of the developers for Chroma as well. Um, no Hell Couch, though? No, I just got to watch that happen. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, I've seen Chroma, so let's talk about that first, and then we can touch base on Hell Couch maybe, if if it's not too dangerous. <laughs> um, so yeah, I saw this one. It looks really cool. It's like an illuminated triangle, and it's like color-based territory capture. I don't know why I wanted to do that right now. You know your game better than I do. You do did I do okay? Is that what it is? You did great. It's it's color blending to capture territory. So you play with. Primary. That's what I said. Yeah, you play with primary colors, and you blend those primary colors into your target secondary colors, and that's how you capture your territory. So it's played over two layers. Okay, and three players, right? Or up to three? Up to three. So it's okay. two to three, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. And it's green, purple, and orange? Those are the target secondary colors. You remembered your art school. I remembered. <laughs> Actually, just, just because I saw it earlier, I'm like, oh, right, colors. I forgot about colors. <laughs> But it looks really cool. How, what gave you guys the idea for this game? Um, well, we wanted to do something that was strategic and fun at the same time. Um, that was heavy math, heavy strategy, uh, but also just like completely satisfying to play and do. And also strategy games, especially things that are abstract the way that we have it, um, aren't necessarily fun to play whether or not you win or lose. Uh, and this one totally is because you're making something that looks cool and feels satisfying no matter what the outcome is. It looked, yeah, the build quality of everything looked very satisfying to like put pieces. Of, now you said something that normally would make me run screaming for the hills from any game. Heavy math? <laughs> what? What? Um, one of the things that people are really good at is thinking in twos. But as soon as you make things happen in threes and put it over two stages, uh, it ends up being a little bit hard. And then when you throw in random probability, uh, which we also have because you're drawing these pieces from a bag, um, as soon as you throw that in there, uh, it gets pretty hard to balance. And I think we're in a good spot with it, but it is a little bit daunting if you are a math person. That's when the math gets heavy. Yeah. yeah. It's, also a fun game to, it's also a fun game to play drunk because uh, it's just pretty. <laughs> It, it was very pretty. Uh, I said, I think I said to you earlier, I was like, we, for our board game show that we do on Easy Allies, I was like, I just want the overhead camera to like zoom in on this board. Yeah. It's, it's very, very cool looking. How, um, how difficult was it to like build something like that, like a light up, plasticky, cool thing? Very difficult, turns out. Uh, Great. So there you no need to elaborate. Yeah. I'm, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, so Kai actually did a lot of the fabrication on the on the board itself. I'm throwing the wrong questions yeah. to the wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. So it was uh, a lot of design, iteration, and laser cutting, and highly toxic glues, and <laughs> LED lights. <laughs> How do you work with all that stuff without like getting shards of plastic in your eyes? Uh, it's less about the plastic, which is just like, those are small cuts and abrasions and pokes. Uh, the really scary thing is the glue that you use to glue uh, acrylic together, which just tells you three times in three different ways, this is going to give you cancer. <laughs> my, uh, my aunt, I have an aunt, here's a family story. I have an aunt who does art with acrylic. She like melts it and then like puts it on a big giant, they're like huge 
art things. But yeah, every time she tells me about it, I'm like, Joyce, you're gonna, you're get your lungs, Joyce. Yeah. You're gonna die. Um, anyway, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so how long did it take you to get the game to the place that it's in now from when you guys came up with it? Whoever starts talking first. Um, so we started it uh, with uh, a class project with uh, a few students um, and then in a slightly separate group project later in that semester, uh, I joined the team and we started iterating on that, um, making it two layers. Um, it's a completely different game now, but um, in terms of like rule set and getting the balance down, that's been about a year of uh, work on and off. Cool. Yeah, I, that's something I really like about this because I've I've played Go or whatever, which may or may not really be a perfect analog for this, but also a territory capture thing. But like, what this has is it's it's three dimensional sort of because you're putting pieces on top of each other and they're all see through plastic. I feel like we didn't mention that. So it's like see through pieces and their colors. They're all primary colors. So when you mix them, you put them on top of each other, they become your target color, and then you count up the little triangles. Yeah. So you have to think. In like two dimensions. <laughs> Shapes and colors are hard, turns out. We've discovered through the process of playtesting this yeah. that even adults who you'd think have graduated from third grade have a really hard time figuring out what colors go together to make their target color and then also how the shapes work on the board, especially in the triangle capacities. Yeah. It's, it's like tan grams and, and color theory all at the same time. Tan grams or tanograms? I think it's tan grams. I think so too, but y you want it to be tanograms. Let's make it tanograms. Yeah. Um, I had a question. Now I forgot it. How? Oh, if you accidentally make someone else's color, uh, do they get those points? Yes. Um, so it doesn't. Color is color. It doesn't matter who made it. Very cool. Also, like probably a life lesson in there, right? <laughs> I don't know. Um, we're, we're queuing up the next group, it looks like. But, you know, if there's only two more groups and we've got 20 minutes, we could take a little time. But let's talk about Hell Couch. What the hell is that? It's a sofa that is a game that you play with your butt. Finally. <laughs> Finally, we've made this happen. How? What? Uh, I hacked a couch. Uh, Francesca Carletto Leon, my uh, collaborator who also worked on Chroma, uh, she and I. Uh, thought that it would be hilarious to make a couch co-op game where the couch was the controller. That is pretty good. So so that's how Hell Couch came into being. And it's basically we installed sensors in it, we installed lights, and hacked a fog machine, <laughs> and uh, recorded some really killer VO, and I, we, we basically possessed a couch. I want to stream that. I want us to do that. Can we do that? Tomorrow night at, at night games, yeah. Tomorrow night at night games. Come to Indicate and you can play Hell Couch. Um, cool. Well, when, when, if, is it, will it ever be possible to get Chroma for individuals in the private sector? And then same question, Hell Couch. You can answer the Chroma part, maybe. Uh, I also would be really excited to see IKEA do a Hell Couch. Yes, yes. <laughs> It just says Hell Couch and it doesn't explain it. But there's like umlauts over the E's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hell Couch. Uh, but no. I feel like that's that's a partnership that should happen. Yeah. But uh, no, for Chroma, uh, we hope to kickstart early next year. Um, we are working with a publisher, but uh, we hope to have it released sometime end of next year um, or early the year after. That's a good answer. That's a great answer. I like hopes and dreams. Plus, something like this, I imagine, it's hard to source the parts in a cost-effective way, and it's a whole nightmare. Kickstarting is hard. It's hard, and uh, no one will ever be able to play Hell Couch at home, right? Probably not. We can make it happen. <laughs> we can make it happen. I, so I actually just built a Hell Couch in my hometown that exists in my living room. So I am, I am the one person right now with a Hell Couch in their living room. You're the only one. I am the only one. <laughs> well, that we know of. Most people with Hell Couches probably just go missing, and uh, never are heard from again. There is there is one in San Francisco, but it's in a studio. It's not in a home. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Chroma with a K, right? Yep. The card was very pretty. The logo I really like. I like the look of it. Um, and Hell Couch, thank, did you get, uh, say your names again? Carol Mertz. Carol. Kai Karhu. Kai Karhu, thank you. This is very 
percussive name. That's good. Uh, all right, thank you both. I'm getting the 10-minute warning, so we're going to switch over. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chroma and Hell Couch, what fun. Come on up. Here, I'll be in the middle, and then surround me, and then uh, I can mic everyone. I'll, I keep picking this weird, wobbly chair. Uh, hi. Yeah, right? I, I'm taking this bullet so you guys don't have to. I got hair in my nose. Uh, hi. What are your names, and what is your game? Uh, I'm Greg Trefry, and we're with the Come On Play Festival. Cool. I'm Nick Fortuno. Pete Vigent. Tell me about this festival. Whoever, here's how we're going to do it. Whoever starts talking first, I'll, I'll just whip the mic at you. Uh, okay, so the Come Out and Play Festival has been around for 15-ish, 14, 12 or 13, 14, 15, 15 like years. Um, and it's a uh, live action urban game festival that is played in New York City and in San Francisco and in Pittsburgh and sometimes in Montreal. And Very cool. Uh, we feature games from around the country that are uh, all mainly physical and sometimes digitally augmented games. Yeah, and all the games are new, right? We're really sponsoring like new work in street games, like gi giving new designers a chance to showcase work and creating new kinds of play in public. That's right. Very cool. And so, like, uh, I imagine, are they all outside? Are they inside? Are they sportsy? Are they role playing, LARPy? Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. So come out and play is it's a, a, a mishmash of a whole bunch of different experimental ideas. Sometimes it's very urban based, like in the streets, uh, like gentrification. Uh, what was it called? The yeah, just the game. <laughs> the game. Um, sometimes they're very sporty, like Circle Rules uh, football or soccer, which is a, a really sporty game that's still played by a whole bunch of folks. Uh, sometimes they're uh, really cool experimental uh, games like um, Killer Queen Arcade, the very first version. Uh, I remember that. Uh, premiered at, at Come Out and Play. Uh, very cool. Uh, the physical version premiered at Come Out and Play. And, um, and also uh, some... Doug Wilson games too, like uh, uh, the one with all the move controllers that were hanging down. Oh, not like not Joust. It was, was the one Joust, after, yeah. which was called uh, Alan something or other, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soiree, soiree, soiree I think yeah, something so, like yeah. that. I, I saw that one at Indiecade. I remember Super that one cool, too. Man. Yeah. So so it's just a mix of all these different ways of getting folks to come out and experience new types of games, getting people who are not traditionally into playing outdoor games or physical games, into playing those games, and giving a spotlight to a lot of younger uh, uh, designers who are just trying to get a foothold in the indie industry, I guess. Very cool. And you've, you've been doing it for 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years? We started in 2006. That was right. Yeah, so I, just, I, don't know how to, I didn't know if, I, if this was inclusive or exclusive, right? So it's either 14 or 13 years. Yeah, it's, it's 14. It's yeah, 14 with 14 that, time. yes. So next Good. Time, I'm glad you didn't make me do any math. That's all I can say. But it's uh, the 14th. It's like the 23rd. Uh, come out and play event, right? Because sure. there, are, there are other festivals in other places. So. Yeah, so how, do, how did the idea for this festival get going? Like, how did you get this thing off the ground? Uh, well, we've been doing like a bunch of uh, work, like making these physical games, people running around the city, and you know, like, people would talk to you and be like, oh, I want to do that. And, like, when can I do that? And, like, never, because they all run once. We done did it already. Yeah, and so we were like, well, let's do a festival. That way we can meet all the designers that are making them. We can bring together a group of, basically, like, introduce the designers to the players, in a way, um, and, uh, and kind of create a groundswell for this uh, sort of work. Very cool. I made, a, I made a game that was actually an indicate a few years ago called Ultimate Super Nightball. That sounds like it would have been right at home. It's old now, so it can't be in it. But it, it sounds like it would have been right at home in Come Out and Play. The show should be starting on time in about seven minutes at seven. I have been smelling that popcorn. Um, when is the next festival? And how do people, uh, you know get involved and hear about it and go to it? Well, uh, you can go to comeoutandplay.org to find out information about the events and the events we're running. Uh, Come Out and Play actually just happened. Uh-oh. Yeah, we just it just happened in, uh, a, a couple weeks ago in September. But we're looking at running smaller events throughout the year, both as ways to showcase games, but also as ways to incubate games. And we're Very cool. building some relationships with like different universities and students to help like grow a community around this. And of course, like other events that go on across the states and around the world that are sort of Come Out and Play inspired 
Lord and that work with our blessing effectively are doing the same thing in other communities. My friend Yuli, who betrayed me once, is making a game. I should tell him about this. I, I, I love Yuli. Come on. You, you got you to work on your betrayal here. Is, is that how you always introduce your friend? Yuli? Yes, actually. Yes. Um, no, well, that's you should. And, and a lot of uh, festivals like IndieCade uh, come to these folks uh, and ask, like, what games should we, what physical games do we need for night games and stuff like that? So, did you, uh, so did you guys pollinate the world with with our designers? Did you guys have that ramen game that I played at IndieCade at E3? Did you see this one? It's you have giant chopsticks and you've got like pipes and like giant plush. Like yeah. food, oh. yeah, but that's like that. That is very much in the spirit of yeah. come out and play. So I some of the it. games are like you project a big thing on a wall, and you have your controller on your phone, and you shoot each other in a little space game that takes like three seconds. And some <laughs> of the games are like giant pool noodle structures where you're trying to keep something up in the air by running with five pool noodles, or you wear a giant hula hoop on your head and you try to throw balls through other people's hula hoops. I want to play all of these. Oh, these yeah. sound great. Or yeah, you play a game the, the where you people. carry a cup of water around secretly through city streets and hope no one catches you with a full cup of water. <laughs> right? or, or, I do that every day. Or a game with like 100 dodgeballs where you try to survive on your team and capture the flag yeah. on the other side without dying. Or a game where you pretend you're 13 and you make out with somebody else. Or oh, a game yeah. you could have yeah, seen at this at this festival where you take pictures of, of, be of, of, of Beanie, Beanie Babies, babies yeah. um, with your phone and try to get the best pictures of them as they pop out in a puppet show. Yeah, like, yeah. all of those things are the kind of things we want to endorse. And it's like, some of that is like, oh, we could genreify it. We could say that there's, there's projection games, there's games you play in like enclosed public spaces, there's games you play in the streets. But essentially what it is, is it's about making something that exists in the world, that like lives in the space that players live in, that gets them to engage with each other for the first time. And I think really the magic of come out and play as Greg kind of suggested is like bringing together the community and players is not just like getting them to play it's getting players of different types to play together it's getting yeah. people who've never met to stumble into something and there's something that like that kind of silly stupid fun does that better than almost anything in the world that does sound amazing and in public too right. like there's a big component of come out and play is that we try to do as much as we can out in the world uh, because that draws in folks and observation is a form of participation. And so we have a lot of folks, especially uh, in Dumbo where we, we've been holding it the last four or five years. Uh, we were down to South Street Seaport. Uh, a lot of folks who just see it and are like, what is this? And they just become the wallflowers and then maybe they step into it and they try something out. Very cool. Greg, I feel bad. I've been facing this way too much. Anything you want to, anything else you want to say? No, I think that these guys got it. That's great. I Great. Yeah, it's very much about like there's a sort of come out and play a very DIY aesthetic. It's often a little silly, um, and yet we take it kind of seriously. So, <laughs> so comeoutandplay.org is the website. Yep, that's right. Comeoutandplay.org. Um, well, I think are we about to go live on the two or three minutes? All right. Well, I'll do a little bit of an outro, and then we're going to need to move the camera over to to prepare for the award show. Thank you so much. Comeoutandplay.org. Check it out. And, uh, and sign no up. Betrayals. No betrayals. betrayals. No betrayals. Yeah. No betrayals. You're done, Yuli. <laughs> You're cut off. All right, everyone. Uh, well, yeah. I'm gonna walk over there. We're gonna pan the camera over, and then the award show will start very, very soon. Don't go anywhere. You wanna talk for a second? Here's Sarah. She's gonna be hosting the award show in two minutes. Yeah, super soon. Are you excited? Are we doing a hug? Are I don't know. Like I was just. Between I was just holding my. <laughs> I don't need this like, is my new interview style. I just like freeze at people. It's, um, it's better than my normal interview style, which is just like making a statement and then doing this. Instead, in the lieu of questions and then leaving me here to make up what I should say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are pretty good about plugging their own stuff, though. So <laughs> no, I'm, plug I'm plugging the show. I think I did it. Don't don't here. leave. Don't <laughs> just watch this thing that you're about to watch right here on twitch.tv slash indicade and hosting partners like Easy Allies. Bless you all. Check out Easy Allies. Do that. That's okay. my thing. Uh, yeah, so you and Asher are the hosts. Yeah. few years you've been doing this. Yeah, I think this is our fourth year. It's always very, very good. Uh, well, I don't want to keep you because probably you've got something to do in a couple of minutes. I don't know. I don't know. Have a heart attack? One minute. Yeah, one one minute, minute to go. All right. She's going to go over there. I'm going to go over there. Don't leave. The award show is about to begin in just a second. Sit tight. Bye, Sarah. Bye.
I'm Sarah L. Male. And I'm Asher Vollmer. And welcome to the 2019 Indiecade Awards. Yeah. We're doing things a little differently this year. We're in a new venue nestled here at the Santa Monica College Center for Media and Design among the festival itself, which is awesome. And we're streaming. Hey, yeah, woohoo! So excited to share it with the world. Um, in developer speak, last year was stream beta, and this is version 1.0. We will not be patching it. Mm -mm. It is the way it is. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming out, for sticking around. Uh, and to those of you watching online, thank you for welcoming us into your homes. Let us know if we should take our shoes off. Uh, it's been another huge year. We say that every year, but seriously, we've got a new console generations just on the horizon. Uh, this year, we also saw a lot of new distribution uh, options enter the arena. Uh, everyone's trying to get a piece of the pie. Epic Games, Google Stadia, and last month with Apple Arcade, it feels like everyone and their dog has a gaming service now. Yet with all these platforms, developers are still wondering, how do their games get seen at all? Sounds like a complicated, nuanced topic to explore. Or, hear me out, I was thinking I'd start my own service. That's a great idea. Isn't it? I love it. We'll yeah. call it Sarah Amal Play. <laughs> and it'll only sell games that you've voiced. So it'll have like 30 Indiecade games and like five minutes of Gears 5. But what an incredible five minutes. Thanks. <laughs> Speaking of AAA, larger games continue to take inspiration from indies by moving in more abstract directions. Death Stranding is so experimental, Kojima doesn't even know what it's about. It's true, and Control definitely has gobs of indie-level stylishness. Oh, you mean inside, but with flying and talking? <laughs> yep, that's what it is. <laughs> All kidding aside, there is no single identifying indie aesthetic or feature. That's what makes them so great. And Indiecade is a reflection of that. As ever, this year's nominees touched a large breadth of narratives, mechanics, and playstyles. And while some games share similar themes, each developer takes ideas in their own creative direction. Take, for example, The Headlands Gamble and The Haunted Island, a frog detective game. Both detective stories, but with very different executions. It's true. In The Headlands Gamble, you LARP as detectives in Marin County. Take a real-life getaway to wine country to stop a criminal from getting away. Meanwhile, in The Haunted Island, a frog detective game, you're a frog. So it's a little less realistic. A frog detective, huh? Ribbiting stuff. I hear the trail went cold after one of the informants croaked. Who could have committed the crime? Fortunately, I'm out of frog puns. We kind of put ourselves in a box with this bit. Is that such a bad thing? There were a lot of great games about boxes this year. Uh, like Mon Cage, the charming, fully furnished, multi-dimensional box. Or ingenious puzzle game Patrick's Parabox. Its use of infinity and recursion gives a whole new meaning to infinity and recursion. <laughs> Indies have thought so far outside the box, they're back inside the box. <laughs> The talented developers in VR are also expanding the joys and opportunities of being stuck inside a virtual box. VR always faced unique challenges, I feel, but the stuff I've been seeing shows it's finding its own accessible interactive language. The language of the VR game Smile Me For Me, for example, is all about nodding and shaking your head. Which is the only way I could communicate after we played Mad Mixologist. Asher, you made that drink very strong. Well, I was making it from your point of view. What do you mean? Look, I can stop anytime I want. No, I mean literally from your point of view. Oh. Your, your eyeballs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, speaking of challenging perspectives, many games invited us to think critically about our world. It's true, indies are excellent at this. Don't Feed the Monkeys exposes the most disturbing aspects of surveillance. This, is what exact, this game is exactly why I keep a sticky note over my webcam, except when I'm eating in front of it for money. <laughs> and while Don't Feed the Monkeys <laughs> politicizes the intimate details of individuals' lives, like eating in front of cameras, <laughs> other games uh, like uh, headliner Nova News take a macro approach to politics and information. You get to control the news cycle and destroy the world. It's basically Fox News the game. Well, <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Uh, while you were destroying the world Murdoch style, I was plotting global domination by running my own political campaign in Shazen. Best opening move in the game, calling the president of Ukraine. Total shortcut, he owes me. You want incriminating conversations. Do I? <laughs> Try, I love these transitions. <laughs> Try, <laughs> Try in human conditions. You interview your opponent to determine whether or not they are a robot. If I was the interviewer, I would just have them check the little capture box. Easy. You know, we've actually allowed machines in online contexts to so fully debase human language that the Turing test is easier than ever now? Huh. We're all talking like bots now. <laughs> well, when we finally abandon English to the bots, we can always create a new language in the game Dialect. 
Although when we played, the only words our society could think of were swear words. To be fair, we were playing as a sailing culture. Half their whole vocabulary should be swears. And the other half should be evocative euphemisms for venereal disease. The uh, vitamin C? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that. Yeah, vitamin C. Yeah. Uh, the only thing missing from Hot Swap, all hands on deck, is, uh, ju- is uh, juicing an orange on a joystick to prevent everyone from getting scurvy. That's true. The way you swap out modular inputs to control different stations on a pirate ship is surprisingly close to the frantic, intricate coordination on a real sailing vessel. Co-op games are a classic and beloved IndieCade mainstay. While AAA games have tended more towards online multiplayer, the indie community continues to cultivate the ineffable magic of sitting with a, on the couch with a friend. Hosting with you is kind of co-op. We have to work together, communicate, and occasionally throw each other off a cliff, you know, for strategy reasons. And what do you know? This brings us to our first award of the night, Cooperative Design. These games are the ones you can enjoy only with friends, even if you don't enjoy your friends. I said I was sorry after th- throwing you off the cliff. Anyway, here to present the award is the amazing, kind, stunningly attractive, and loyal friend, game designer on titles such as Journey and What Remains of Edith Finch, Chris Bell. Yay! Playing with others... Cooperating with friends and allies toward a shared experience is at the heart of many of human history's most proud moments. Experience designed to create inventive and unique interactions that bring us together, working toward a shared goal. The Cooperative Design Award rewards those experiences that innovate in how we play together. And the winner of the Cooperative Design Award is... TikTok, A Tale for Two. Here's what the jury had to say about TikTok, A Tale for Two. Creating an experience that compels two players to communicate and to learn to collaborate in new ways is a challenging and powerful craft. TikTok, A Tale for Two brings play to the space of communication and trust, leveraging information and level design to build compelling cooperative interactions. Hello. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we're super excited that we won an award. I say we. Um, I helped launch the game. Uh, we do the marketing for TikTok Hotel for two. The girls unfortunately couldn't be here because they are super busy um, doing the porting for their um, Switch version. So yeah, we're excited that we're here. Thank you so much for voting and yeah, thank you. Yay! Next up, we have the award for procedural design. These games use algorithms to generate unique experiences for each player. In light of that, I thought it'd be fun uh, for an algorithm to write the next part of the script. Uh, I fed a bot the Indicate Award from scripts for the past four years, and this is what it came up with. This is real. It actually did this. It's actually true. Okay. Welcome to the tactility of its programming. Sarah Amale is a game by Robert Yang, in which we play. I've been attending since I think it's a game about a game come out a while. Up next, we have to interact with a unique experience. It's organic, it's intimate, it's bittersweet. Grand Jury Award, as the ice melts in the courtyard. (laughs) Yeah, give a round for the bot. Yeah, Yeah. yeah, worked really hard on that. Um, Well, that was nightmarish. (laughs) Thought I was a game, made by Robert Yang. I could never be so lucky. Although you gotta admit that Indicate is organic, intimate, and bittersweet. Yeah. Uh, no worries, I think I can work out the kinks and report back later. Okay, while Asher works on that, let's all welcome founder of Blendo Games, Brendan Chung, to present the award for procedural design. The Procedural Design Award honors a game that leverages random generation and technical know-how and combines them to create something bigger than the sum of its parts. It explodes into something unique and unexpected, surprising the player and oftentimes surprising the developers themselves. This award celebrates innovation in procedurally generating game content and the joy of discovery. And the winner is... Blabyrinth. That's 
from the jury. Many games leverage procedural generation, whether for art and space generation, or state management, fundamental rules and activities, or unique challenges and narrative events. Very few manage to leverage procedural elements to innovate the way play experiences are approached and perceived. And Blabyrinth's proceed, uh, powerful procedural elements create compelling player-to-player -player communication and loops that feel unique and provide a fresh outlook on what can be a tired genre. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank Sam and Phil, my artist and musician who can't be here, and also Sarah and Nori, my wife and daughter, for their patience while I continue making this game. And now, the award for tabletop design. What starts out as a few symbols and tokens can become an entire adventure or battle of wits that plays out entirely in the room's imagination. Interactive design at its purest, most human form, tabletop games have the power to create special friendships and lifelong nemeses. Don't, you mean memories? Did I stutter? Uh, this category's only constraint is the player's brains and the surfaces they're playing on. Doesn't it suck when you're playing a giant board game and it doesn't fit on your kitchen table? Ever tried imagining a larger table? <laughs> Let's table this discussion. <laughs> uh, our next presenter comes to us from Kickstarter, who provided impactful and deeply appreciated sponsorship support to indicate this year. Formerly of AddictingGames.com and Nickelodeon, please welcome current director of games outreach at Kickstarter, Anya Combs. I get really excited when my name is pronounced correctly, so thank you. <laughs> Friends staring across a board, a hand of cards, or even a chaotic pile of detailed paper notes. Games played at the table leverage the imagination in players to create unique and companionable experiences. This is the heart of games for many of us. The Tabletop Design Award celebrates the indie tabletop games of the year that innovate, surprise, and delight the heart. And the winner of the Indicade 2019, forgot the year, Tabletop Award is Inhuman Conditions. From the jury, utilizing gorgeous materials, a clever idea, and a fantastical situation rich in metaphoric meaning to create tiny, bite-sized nuggets of robotical role-play, Inhuman Conditions is a unique and lovely tabletop gaming experience. Uh, wow, thank you very much. Uh, thank you especially to my co-creator, Corey, uh, for all the late night emails where you were right and I was wrong. Uh, uh, to our artist, Mac. This is not recorded or anything, right? Uh, to our artist, Mac, uh, who's a genius. To our tireless community manager, uh, Maya Coleman. To our 8,369 backers who helped make this a reality. And uh, I want to use this chance to tell Kickstarter to get off its ass and recognize the union. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> While the beauty of tabletop games is that they can be played almost anywhere, sometimes location is essential to a game's identity. That's why this year we're presenting the award for location-based and live play design. These games are an exciting amalgamation of theater, interaction, and immersive experience. It's always a thrill watching developers bust open and reinvent the magic circle. I almost didn't get to play all of them because I got stuck at the house. Waiting for a plumber or something? No, I was playing AR box at home and couldn't figure out how to escape my own dang living room. I almost didn't make it to the show tonight. Wow, was Airbox really that challenging? Well, yes, uh, but then I misplaced my car keys, which just means it's Friday. Well, we're glad you made it. Thanks. And we're glad to introduce the award for location-based and live play design. Here to present is the co-founder of Playmatics and of Come Out and Play, Nick Fortuno. Thank you. 
The oncoming frontier of play and experience design includes the amazing worlds of immersive theater, themed experience, virtual and augmented reality spaces, escape rooms, and more explorations of bespoke physical experiences, often designed for groups of people and social engagement. The location-based and live design, live play design award rewards experiences innovating in these spaces and creating magical new spaces for play. And the winner of the location-based and live action award at Indicate 2019 is... Amos Momento. <laughs> The jury said, as we explore the space of location-based play and use of live bodies in non-sporting games, many technologies, art forms, and interaction paradigms are colliding in the hearts and minds of the design community. Amma's Memento cha channels many of these through the heart of a central narrative and a person who you come to know deeply by engaging in multiple intersecting experiences, leveraging VR, projection mapping, and human-to-human -human communication. I'm going way, way down. Even deeper than you have ever been before. Thank you guys. Um, we didn't prepare for this. <laughs> like, if you were to be in that room this morning, um, you wouldn't have imagined that we have the setup that we have. It was, it was very difficult for us to put everything together. And if it weren't for the community that came together, and that really supported and really appreciated our stories, I don't think any of this would be worthwhile. And I just want to say that this is a moment to remember, and thank you. You need the method from beginning to end. At its core, Indicade celebrates play. And tonight, we remember someone who made the whole world his playground, Bernie DeCoven, and honor a kindred crew of creators. Bernie dedicated his life to researching and furthering the field of fun and games, specifically large-scale physical games. The Bernie DeCoven Big Fun Award honors these collaborative games that Bernie loved so much. So to celebrate Bernie, let's open up the Ark of Decovenant and unleash some big fun. Don't close your eyes for this one. Please welcome Indiecade co-founder Celia Pierce to present the award. Rockstar. <sighs> Hello. This annual honorary award was created in collaboration with Bernie DeCoven to honor his legacy and recognize creators significantly furthering the field and impact of new, big, and physical games. We love big, pervasive games because of the way they bring people together and forge connections on a large scale. Ah, the rest of my speech is not in the iPad. Okay. Excuse me. <sighs> it was first created in 2017 in collaboration with Bernie DeCoven shortly before his death from cancer and honors an individual or group that has made a major contribution to advancing physical, social, and large-scale play. Past recipients of the Big Fun Award have included Humans vs. Zombies and Douglas Wilson. For those who didn't know him, Bernie DeCoven was a pioneer in the 1970s new games movement. You know, the people who brought you rainbow parachutes and the knots game. In his book, The Well-Played Game has been highly influential in the development of academic programs and scholarship. In 2007, inspired by Bernie's work, Ludica, myself, Tracy Fullerton, Janine Fraun, and Jackie Mori, published a paper in Games and Culture called Sustainable Play, in which we called for a new new games movement. Among the pioneers we cited in that paper were this evening's Big Fun awardees. Founded in 2006, New York's Come Out and Play was the first festival in the US to bring together a critical mass of physical and digitally augmented social games. Jet fueling a nascent movement and spurring innovation. It was one of the few places where you could play pervasive games and alternate reality games, local massively multiplayer games, alt control games, and games involving wearable tech before these emerging genres garnered public attention. 
Come Out and Play has also been highly influential on IndieCade, and the two festivals share many games and developers, such as 2017 Big Fun recipients, Humans vs. Zombies, and this year's eSports keynote, Killer Queen, which originally appeared as a field game in both festivals. Come Out and Play's founders and organizers are also IndieCade alumni whose own games have been featured in our festivals and showcases and are in, the, in this festival this year and have served as chairs for IndieCade's Big Games and Night Games events at other IndieCade festivals and showcases. The Bernie DeCoven Big Fun Award celebrates the joy of physical, social, and public play, and nobody celebrates these forms like Come Out and Play, to whom it is my great pleasure to present this award. Awesome. Uh, thank you guys so much. So uh, Come Out and Play has always been very much a uh, community event. I mean, that's how we always thought about it, as a community of play, right? Um, and so I want to thank uh, a bunch of folks, uh, IndieCade, Stephanie, Celia, and Sam, for your guys' support over the years. Uh, Night Games, for the, as Celia mentioned, the partnership that's kind of gone on for a long time between Come Out and Play and Night Games. Uh, but then there's also the other founders that aren't here tonight. There's Catherine and Deborah and Mattia. Pete and Albert and Dalton and Josh and Heather who ran in San Francisco. Uh, there's Hide and Seek in London where with uh, Alex and Margaret and Holly and Igfest run by Simon and Simon. Uh, City of Play which was uh, run by Adam and Greg. Plaython which was started by Chloe. Play Public in Berlin and Sebastian and the DC Games Festival and Limor. Um, for us, it's always been about like all of these people playing all over the place. Uh, and so, uh, just a shout out to all those people. We think of all of you guys as part of the big come out and play family. And uh, it's it's I, I really can't even put into words what an honor it is to to receive this award as come out and play for all of us in the honor of Bernie to COVID and really the spirit of what the New Games Movement was, which was about that sense of community and in a lot of ways the freedom and the permission that play gives you to be something else and to be something other than the world we live in. Um, for me, maybe the truest moment of, of, of big games I've ever seen was when, when uh, Katie Salen and Frank Lance and I made the big urban game and there was a moment when uh, in part of the game you would roll these giant pair of dice uh, to, for your team to move forward and random people in the street would come by and roll the dice and these two little girls with their dad rolled the dice and they could only roll the dice once and when they realized that they begged their dad to roll the dice and their dad is a 40 year old guy who's clearly a tough guy who takes himself very seriously but his, his six year old daughters were begging so he rolled the dice and he rolled doubles which is an award so everyone screamed and the kids screamed and he got to roll the dice again and so he went up to roll the dice again and when he finished rolling the dice he almost cried. And what I realized in that moment was that play gave him this permission. It gave them this permission to be something that wasn't like a 40-year-old dad. It was like something else that he could be through play. And I think that's, that's where all of us so much what Come Out and Play is about. It gives you permission to be stupid. It gives you permission to run around with a pool noodle or throw 50 dodgeballs or pretend you're making out with somebody or, or, or take pictures of beanie babies or take pictures with balloons running around the street or conga line across Times Square or run with a cup that may have water in it and hope you don't get caught or pretend that like you are one of the chosen surrounded by Goyam and try to do Olympic events or play patty cake with electronics or shoot something on a virtual screen with 50 other people and all of those things are dumb. Right? They're all dumb and silly and ridiculous, but they give you permission to do those things. They give you permission to meet people. They give you permission to, to, to relax. They give you permission to enjoy. Right? And that kind of play, I think, is something that's so valuable and important. And when I look over the 300 games or so that have been created for Come Out and Play and all of the designers who made that possible, when I remember looking out across the day at field games and seeing a thousand people doing stupid things in public, for no other reason than to do stupid things, I realized that, that that's at the heart of, I think, a lot of what New Games is. And as Bernie said, better than anybody in a playful path, maybe freedom itself is fun. And maybe fun itself is freedom. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
I'm going to cry. Can I retire yeah. and let Nick do the rest of the show, please? That's incredible. My stars. Yeah, one more applause. That was yes, incredible. Yes, please. Yeah. Give it up for Come Out and Play. Oh, oh my God. How about All we right. make some dumb jokes now? Okay, yeah. In the spirit we're back. of play. We're okay, back. again. We're <laughs> we have the freedom to be stupid. And to, to be stupid is freedom. So that's right. Our next award is for adaptation, which celebrates the versatility of games as a medium. The developers of games in this category find inspiration in unconventional places. Anything can be adapted into the context of play, but that doesn't mean it's easy. It requires both a deep understanding of both the source material and the imagination to recontextualize it. The end product is surprising and new, but still feels familiar. Plenty of familiar concepts can be adapted to games, books, movies, current events, and real-life systems, like maybe even a unionized labor structure. Oh, interesting. I can see that working very well. Yeah. You know, if horse jockeys have a union, we could have one. If mailmen have three unions, we could have, like, one. Um, hell, even forgers and blacksmiths have a union. How come the characters we design in our video games get more benefits than we do? RPGs, anybody? Yeah. It's a question being asked more than ever this year, and hey, I've always said that if anyone can adapt and perfect the union as mechanism, it's game developers, especially as investigative and imaginative as the devs in this category. Here to present the award for adaptation are faculty at USC Games, cast members on Champions of the Earth, and co-creators of the Claxo Radio Hour, uh, Radio Hour and AR Box. I was in that game. Jesus. <laughs> uh, Jesse V. Hill and Marcy Campos. The inspiration for games comes from many different sources and places. Some games interpret the world or another piece of media, reflect a documentary of real world systems, or they adapt the experience of other places and stories to explore the innovative edge of why we play. The Adaptation Award celebrates a game that examines and interprets using the logic of play and the power of interaction. Tonight we honor a work that reimagines how a well-known tale, a genre, or system can be explored within the context of play. And I have the envelope. <laughs> and the adaptation award goes to... When Rivers Were Trails. From the jury, adaptation in games is both a long-standing tradition, play that explores real-world systems interactions, and a relatively newfangled invention games that explore telling the stories of other mediums through play. When Rivers Were Trails is a significant achievement in touching both this tradition and invention, reimagining a classic educational video game to explore a different cultural lens and its narrative while helping reframe the educational experience of early America. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I am Rebecca Roman. I'm the lead sound designer on When Rivers Were Trails, and I'm accepting this on behalf of El Dr. Elizabeth LaPense, the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, and the Games for Entertainment and Learning Lab at Michigan State U University. Thank you. Next, we come to the award for narrative design. There's one thing indie games are known for, it's the ability to craft unique, compelling narratives. Indie developers have proved that you don't need millions of dollars to tell a deeply inspiring story. It amazes me that some of these games are able to manage so many branching storylines. I can barely manage my one real life storyline. Oh, you only have one? I have five. My secret family in Utah thinks I'm on a business trip. <laughs> Good thing we're not streaming this to the whole world. Here to present the award for narrative design are Molly Maloney, former narrative designer at Telltale Games and current lead narrative designer at Bad Robot Games, and Eric Sturpey, writer on Minecraft Story Mode, Batman the Telltale Series, and Fortnite Save the World. Put your hands together for Molly and Eric. This recording will not cure you of anything. Make yourself really, really calm. <laughs> Hi, everyone. As human beings, it's in our nature to tell stories, and games are no exception. As the definition of video game grows across boundaries, platforms, and formats, there are seemingly limitless ways to tell these stories in exciting new ways. From complex dialogue trees to amazing emergent characters, from sagas of far-off civilizations to slice-of-life dramas in our own backyard, the Narrative Award celebrates accomplishment and innovation in the field of interactive storytelling. 
And the award goes to... Neocab. Make yourself really, really comfortable. From the jury, games tell stories in many different ways. One of the hallmarks of play is its ability to convey narrative, create narrative, and be an experiential canister for narrative. Not every game does all of these things, but Neocab is a game that perhaps does them all with polish and intention lavished on stories that feel real while being perfectly suited to their medium and genre. Thank you so much. Um, we're a huge team. It was a really great honor to work with such wonderful, talented, brilliant people. And I think the passion that every creative brought to Neocab really inspired us on the writing side to push, uh, to make something that lived up to what everyone was contributing to the game. Uh, we're a huge team. We have two of them here. Uh, but we were led by our in intrepid leader, Patrick Ewing. Um, shout out to him. And I just want to say that we made a very emotional game that wears its heart on its sleeve. And it's wonderful to see that recognized. Uh, stay human, everyone. Great. <laughs> Even deeper than you have ever been before. Many aspects contribute to making a game special. And for the first time at Indiecade, we're awarding the folks who lend their bodies and voices to bring these games to life. I just want to point out that this award could recognize so many different acting techniques. It's, personally speaking, it's a lot, keeping up with all the skills and technologies that go into performing in games these days. Immersive theater, booth voiceover, interactive film, performance capture, all of these are normally very distinct specializations, but all are utilized and hybridized in games work. My incredible peers in this space overcome fresh technical challenges to embrace brand new opportunities to connect with players, and I am so excited to honor them. Really? Because um, I had an idea. Why don't I be a voiceover actor? Okay. See? Yeah. Uh, I'm really good at impressions. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You want to hear one? Hit me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that Elvis? Uh, no, I was doing our next winner. Oh, well... Sure, all right, yeah, that, that works. <laughs> well done. Uh, folks, please give a warm welcome to an actor who crushes in each of these acting forms, the gal who does it all and makes it look easy. She's Aloy in Horizon Zero Dawn, Chloe in Life is Strange, and can soon be heard as Sam in After Party and the Musher in the Red Lantern. Welcome, Ashley Birch. Hey, everybody. The Performance Award honors a game with a unique or particularly sublime performance. Voice, motion capture, video, live, and more. As games grow in cultural weight and professional development, the field of independent development has involved a larger variety of artists from all disciplines. The brilliant pacing, empathy, and understanding of the best performances have been harnessed this decade to make some of the most arresting play experiences we have ever seen. This award celebrates the actors doing amazing work in the field of play. And the winner is The Occupation. From the jury, the personalities, creatures, and people in games can come to life through a well-recorded voice, a perfectly captured moment, or a wisely acted character. As games diversify, these performance skills and more are leveraged across game genres. The Occupation shows the strength of a compelling, talented voice cast to help bring meaning, gravitas, and levity to a compelling narrative that presents an uncommon set of emotions and interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh my god. I, lo I love it when the winners show us up. Yeah, I love when <laughs> everyone in the else in the show shows us up. That's way how it should be. <laughs> Coming up, we have the Jury Prix. This award honors a game that distinguished itself in ways not expressed by the other awards. To borrow another French phrase, it has a certain je ne sais quoi. The winner for this award is hard to choose because indie games by nature are entirely je ne sais quoi. That's a, that's a really good point, Asher. How do we choose these games, then? Uh, that's above my pay grade. But why don't we, uh, we have our own hidden house, uh, Sam Roberts. Ah, explain. yes. He's like Professor X, assembling a scrappy team of misfits made stronger by their difference to change the world for the better. When you put it that way, he's a lot like Professor X. 
Except with better hair. <laughs> Let's welcome Assistant Director of USC's Interactive Media and Games Division uh, and Indicate Festival Director Sam Roberts to the stage. Woo! Hey, everybody. Everybody having a good time tonight? Great. Uh, so I do this every year. I'm going to get up and I'm going to tell you again, uh, if you don't know, uh, how we do this just a little bit. Uh, so when you who are sitting out there uh, decided to submit your games to the festival, they went into our giant games database um, and they were played and reviewed. Uh, we have a two-tier jury, so we have a large public jury made up of former game developers who've been here in this festival. Um, they play the games, they tell us which ones they like and which ones they don't, and while we're doing that, a curatorial review committee is looking at every game's documentation, video, uh, your artistic statements, and uh, more, and saying what they find interesting. We take both these lists, we jam them together, we review everything on it again, and we use this to make uh, a, a larger list that we call the short list. Um, <laughs> I like to say list a lot. Uh, so anyways, um, that is then reviewed by the jury committee and by curators working on specific awards or parts of the event like night games or the activities program or esports. Um, and there's a back and forth communication, suggestions the jury might say, this is interesting for. Um, a curator might say, I looked at this and you guys should definitely make sure that this is nominated for an award. Uh, so we go through that process and we come up with a list of nominees. Uh, now this year for the first time we changed the way our awards work a little bit. We used to make a large batch of nominees that ha was eligible for every award. Uh, this year we still have a fairly large batch of nominees that are eligible for many awards, but that's actually just uh, four of the awards. Uh, innovation in Experience Design, Innovation in Interaction Design, uh, Jury Pre, and Grand Jury. Um, the rest of the awards each had a separate nomination list, uh, and those games might overlap with the big list or might not, um, but between them all, they all became this year's Indicate nominees. Uh, who are you who are listening to me right now? Um, we engage other experts sometimes or curatorial groups for all of that stuff, uh, but it draws from this large review that's done by you, right? Uh, or you next year, I hope. Um, the game developers who come here form the community that sort of forms the basis of what we are looking for and what we are interested in. And the jury committee serves to help make sure that we can celebrate um, the entire breadth and diversity of play and anticipate and engage with new types of play or experiences or games that might be very hard to submit in a traditional way. Maybe you don't have like a Steam code that you can share with us and that's okay. Um, and we want to be able to anticipate and be open to the experiences that you are making and want to bring to us because you think they are playful and important. Uh, and every year you impress me by doing this again and again and in more amazing ways and by integrating everything you are seeing here and inventing things I have never seen before. And I appreciate it very deeply. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah. Uh, and now I just want to welcome uh, the creator of Kleptocrat, How to Hide Dirty Money, and the director of visualization design at the Mintz Group, which is a global investigative firm. Please welcome Erwin Chen. Hi. The Indicade Jury Pre Award is for a game the jury wishes to confer honor for separating itself from the pack through its craftsmanship innovation and or design. And the 2019 Indiecade Jury Pre Award goes to Grace Bruxner Presents The Haunted Island, a frog detective game. From the jury, sometimes a game is full of an effervescent energy so deep that it brings a smile to the face of those discussing it and populates their thoughts at the strangest times. Grace Bruxner presents The Haunted Island, a frog detective game, is the game that the jury couldn't quit this year, enraptured by its characters, setting, and play situations. Hi. Um, so I am not Grace or Tom or Dan. 
Um, but Grace is watching, so hi Grace. Um, and she did send me a Twitter DM with what to tell you guys. So she says, also I'm gonna try and read it in her voice. So sorry Grace in advance. Um, she says, hello everybody. It's me Grace right here in the, fr in the flesh in front of you. Thank you so much for liking my silly game and giving it so much love. I would like to thank my collaborators, Tom and Dan, and give a special shout out to Doug, Lisey, Jake, and the rest of House House, and Lura for speaking these words with her mouth. If you're hearing these words, it means I have won an award, which is cool. Thank you again for the love. Thank you from Australia, from Grace. So, Asher, how is our speech writing AI coming along? I worked out some of the bugs. Yeah, you were working on it. Yeah, I was working you all. <laughs> yeah, you saw <laughs> that. Like, yeah. With my um, brain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the first script was too dry. I wanted to be a bit more exciting and energized, so I threw in some commercial scripts to help us better sell the awards. Okay, let's see here. This year's award recipient is a lemon, lime, or orange. You get them both free. To present the award for best freelancer-friendly healthcare plan, I hate broccoli. Fresh fruit, ice, a splash of cream. And that is not a glue, but a super-powered epoxy that you and everyone in this year's Indicade made possible. Piping hot fettuccine Alfredo in a community through shared appreciation and respect. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, robot. All right. Um, well, the good news is it wants us to, uh, to get a healthcare plan. That's very uniony. That's very nice. Uh, the bad news, it still makes no sense. No, that was bad. Yeah. Uh, maybe ads weren't the right ingredient. Let me try novels next. Mm, colder, but uh, keep working because we've got a few more awards to announce. Which brings us to the Innovation and Experience Design Award. This award goes to the game that transports and transforms you through a skillfully crafted experience. Just like this show. Oh, for sure, right? Like. Right, guys, right? Yes! And the people at home. I'll take that as a yes. All right. <laughs> Here to present the award for innovation and experience design is CEO and roustabout of Two-Bit Circus, Brent Bushnell. <laughs> All right, this is a category very close to my heart. Uh, innovation and experience design honors a game that provides a unique and curated experience. This can come with or without a rich narrative. Uh, it takes the player on an emotional arc that can't be had anywhere else. And the winner goes to... Mon Cage. From the jury. As the field of play widens and deepens, games that target unusual and unique player experiences continue to bubble to the fore. Mon Cage, in hiding visual information in a uniquely explorable way, frames the experience of discovery and puzzle solving in a unique metaphor that provides an experience unlike any other. Hi guys, thank you all. Uh, we are team up too, but my partner is not here. She's in the hotel. Uh, I want to especially uh, thanks for my girlfriend who support me for making this game and also setting up for the showcase. Thank you all. And now it's time for the Game Changer Award. Most of our awards at Indiecade go to games, but the Game Changer Award goes to a person or group who has made a true and lasting impact on the industry. At Indicade, we think it's important to recognize the innovators who've moved the space forward. And that can look like a lot of things, whether it's making the games community a better place for everyone, or blowing our minds with a groundbreaking, groundbreaking gameplay concept. Yeah, we've passed so many milestones that we once thought were impossible. Cross-platform playability? Impossible. Realistic hair? Impossible. Veggie option at Burger King? Impossible Whopper. <laughs> and now... Now to present, who went above and beyond me this year, please welcome to the stage professor at the NYU Game Center and CEO at Glow Up Games, Mitu Kandaker. Hi, everyone. So I could not be more thrilled or honored to be here today to introduce the recipients of the 2019 Indiecade Game Changer Award. 
The Game Devs of Color Expo, which just celebrated its fourth annual event over the summer, is an incredible force for positive change. And I just want to tell you a little bit about what the expo means for not just the games community in New York in particular, but to the industry as a whole. So I moved to New York to join the faculty of the NYU Game Center the same year the inaugural GDOC Expo happened. And as such, I've been lucky enough to witness, year upon year, just how much incredible joy and beautiful exuberance for games and their creators the Game Devs of Color Expo brings to the iconic Schomburg Center in Harlem. As someone who grew up seeing no game characters, let alone game developers who looked like me, I can't even begin to describe the bittersweet joy I feel, and honestly it makes me a little bit emotional thinking about it, when I go to the Game Devs of Color Expo and I see young children and teens of color not only playing games in which they can see characters who look like them, but also getting the opportunity to meet the developers of color who made them. Words can't describe what something like this means to the life of a young aspiring developer and how important, how important it is this event is truly changing the lives of those of us who don't get to see ourselves represented in games themselves and the industry. It's also providing such an important platform for those of us developers of color who are already here and already making games. The fact is we are here and we deserve to celebrate that. And all of this exists thanks to the incredible hard work of the organizers, who I know work tirelessly on not only the Game Devs of Color Expo itself, but also individually doing on many, many fronts the hard and multifaceted advocacy that it takes to enact true change. And that's in addition to doing the hard work of just making games and being great game developers themselves. They're wonderful and they really are changing the industry, changing the world and changing the game. Congratulations to the organizers of the amazing Game Devs of Color Expo. You've created something truly impactful, so please come on up to the stage. Chris Algu, Sean Alexander Allen, Brian Carr, Brian Chung, JG Lately, and Kat Small, who couldn't be here. Hi. Uh, so we first of all, we want to thank uh, Indiecade for recognizing the Game Devs of Color Expo as a game changer. For many of us, Indiecade has a very special place in our lives and careers. We as a small group who run the GDOC Expo, as well as the larger disparate group of marginalized folks in games, have spent years discussing both outwardly and in smaller groups the often nebulous topic of race and games, trying to find a path forward. A few of these talks have been here at IndieCade, but many of our discussions have also been about how games events, including the Game Developers Conference, PAX, and even IndieCade, as well as just many others that don't really focus on you know, smaller marginalized groups, through their various diversity initiatives of uh, we're not really servicing marginalized people in a way that actually felt revolutionary, and oftentimes those initiatives feel very exclusionary. Sticking creators with their games or their talks in tents and other separate parts of events and labeling them as diverse spaces is a way of ostracizing them, not including them. So eventually, Kat Small, who could, we are sad cannot be with us today because she's traveling and we didn't really know that we were getting this award until very recently she basically put the team on her back and with her very small team with Brooklyn Gamery with Chris uh, they worked to bring together the game developers color a uh, game devs of color expo in 2016 and the fact that a queer black woman would work so hard to wrangle folks together to start a whole ass game conference is unsurprising as black women, black femmes, and black non-binary folks are often at the forefront of revolutions and getting that shit done. 
yet in games and other spaces, they are most often overlooked, but in games particularly, this is to the point where many just don't see themselves as part of the greater game scene and struggle on the sidelines to find work and often end up leaving games behind entirely. To say the Game Devs of Color Expo caught everyone off guard is an understatement. The response of people who feel it is an event they needed is why we keep doing it year after year. In the years following the 2016 event, we moved to the Schomburg Center of Black, for Black Research in Harlem in New York. It has grown exponentially and we have to thank our, all of our sponsors over the years, our exhibitors who show their amazing games that we sh let they show for free, our speakers who give their valuable knowledge and expertise, our staff, which includes many contributors and volunteers who are all paid and for their time, and of course, all of the attendees that come from all over, including we just had a class of like 40 kids that came from another town. It's 40 black boys who just came to learn about black history in the Schomburg Center. And the guy came up, said, hey, what do you want to do? And I said, bring them on in. And there's a lot of nice pictures of them with Nintendo uh, playing the Labo. So we've had some stumbles over the years. This year, we had to deal with a visa that we did not get, that we did not give enough time to get approved. And something that we all need to work on, all, all organizers, is that uh, we can't expect all developers to be at our events and also to have somebody fill in for them over time. Uh, and because, especially when they don't have enough time to plan travel, that can become very costly without any help financially to try to get them here and without enough time for visas. Uh, we cannot penalize those developers. We can't strip them of their availability to win awards and we need to work harder to make sure that we are including those who cannot be present. We want to see a future, future, a near future, where game creators of color as well as uh, musicians, influencers, educators, writers, and more are no longer at the margins, but are up front and shining for everyone to see. It is great to see Geneva with Skater Date. We have been honored to have their game at our event and have them speak for their experiences of working on and working to release that game. We've had at two events and had them speak this year as well. Uh, we can make all of our diverse spaces we want, but until, we make, or until we're making exceptional efforts for mentorship and funding, we are failing the marginalized who we so desperately need making games. We need successful indies and indie publishers to recognize the racial, cultural, and ethnic gaps in our art form and work to give individual funding to projects that are outside of their comfort zones and hire people who do not fit their company culture. We also need these folks to come to the Game Devs of Color Expo or events like it because everyone who comes feels a very specific vibe about the space that is something I never knew was possible. You need to see for yourselves what it's like for devs of color to feel seen and accepted and on equal footing with everyone else. When we think about why the games industry is the way that it is, you have to remember that a big difference between games and cinema is that games never got their black exploitation moment where the culture shifted because the money shifted. Let's shift that money and shift that culture. Thank you. When I think about how we interact with games, I think of the controller. But at one point, the controller was a new innovation. Before that, we just had a joystick. And before that, stick in a hoop. And before that, just a stick. Exactly. I guess, I guess what I'm saying, trying to say is our next award represents how far the humble stick has come. Because there are so many way, uh, ways to play games, and we certainly haven't explored them all yet. I mean, we may never. The Innovation and Interaction Design Award recognizes the intrepid souls who forge ever deeper into uncharted territory. Without them, we'd still be playing tic-tac-toe in the dirt. You know, with the right art artist statement, that could be an indicate darling. Yeah, it really could. <laughs> Better submit it now before someone else clones it. Sorry, Asher. Um, here to present the award is co-founder of Tender Claws, Samantha Gorman. Hello, 
Innovation and interaction design honors the specialized artistry and innovation required to engage with games on a new level. This may be in the form of controllers, unique interface design, or bold new game mechanics. At its utmost, the Interaction Award acknowledges a work that asks us to reconsider the ways in which we play. And the winner is... <laughs> Hot Swap, all hands on deck. From the jury. What if the game is not only accessed through an alternative controller, but it is the alternative controller? By asking us to mod, change, create a physical controller on the go, HotSwap il illustrates how we can push the boundaries of designing interaction. Hi. I just want to say thank you to Indicate for having such an awesome venue for us to show our weird games. Uh, I want to thank the place where I go to school. I'm a student. Uh, I'm a PhD student. I get to make weird games all the time at the Atlas Institute at CU Boulder. I want to thank my collaborator, Clement, who couldn't be here today, but is the most brilliant person I've ever met and is the reason our game is so crazy. Thank you. Well, we are darn near the end now, people. But before we give away the final award tonight, please welcome to the stage Indicade CEO, Stephanie Barish. You will become very deeply relaxed. This is gonna be too high. Uh, well, you would think after 14 years, I would not have scribbled notes up here, but I do. Um, and they're more scribbled than ever because there's more people I have to thank. But I have to say, I've been sitting here enjoying this show so much. Thank you, Sarah and Asher, for all the work that you've put into this. And to our team of writers and producers that really took this on and care about this show so much and care about this community so much. So I've had the good fortune to work with so many people for so many years. And I have to start by thanking my co-founders, Celia Pierce and Sam Roberts. I have worked with them for 14 years now, and we all still love each other. And every year are excited with what we get to do. Uh, I can't think of anything better. Um, except for maybe our weekly meetings, which are fantastic with our more extended core group of people. And I, I have to, like, I'm sorry in advance anybody that I forget to name, because I will, but there's so many people that work on this event, and there's some people that, you know, really donate and give so much of their time and their heart and they care. It's kind of our lives. And it's so meaningful to watch everybody get these awards. I've been just enjoying watching it so much. Um, I want to thank David Havalosa for, he's the reason we're here at the Center for Media and Design. He spent years trying to beg us to come here, sending students to us, um, and it's really appreciated that we're here in Santa Monica. Uh, it really takes a village to put Indicade together. Um, it, it, there's such an extra, uh, so many people that work on it. We have a core group of people that work for the whole year. So Sean, Parker, and Aaron. I think Aaron is the reason that everything actually works, but it's everybody. I love working with all of you every, every day. Um, and I'm, I feel really grateful to have these people for so, uh, working so much and they deserve the acknowledgement. They're very behind the scenes. Um, but thank you guys. Um, and then there's more people that work with us too. There's Chris, who's running our alumni network. There's Jamie, who along with Glitch City are organizing night games and are a wonderful community. And Jamie did all the cute artwork that you see everywhere this year. She's so talented. Scott, who's been taking our pictures for all of these years. Uh, Butena covering our social media. Uh, today, Sunny and Willa being my very best friends and supporting and helping. Uh, Leah, who's for years run our game tasting. Uh, our conference committee, Elizabeth, 
uh, Celia again, John and Jeremy, who put on this, the worked on the conference, um, and all of our our jury committee, our jury, our all of you developers. I mean, that's why we do it. Our production staff and so many volunteers. I think if I asked like people to stand up who have worked on Indicade, it would almost be everybody, and then the rest of you probably will work on it at some time in the future, we hope. But it's, it's really, the, the community is so important. And one thing I like to do each year is to acknowledge um, some people who've worked with us for like five or more years. Um, because it's incredible how long people have devoted themselves to this in many different ways. I have a gift. There's two people I'm going to acknowledge this year. I have a gift for you that I forgot at home, so I'll bring it tomorrow. Um, sorry. Um, but I have prints from the very first Indicate that we made that I've saved to give to the people that have given so much to, to us and to everybody. Um, so. There's one person that has done very many um, things with us. Um, they might have been the person walking down the street one time in the first or second Indicate and said, oh, I think we should have, um, we should do something at night, maybe night games. Um, who ch chaired our big games, our, um, our night games, our jury, um, was on the jury committee this year. So that is Colleen Macklin. She's spoken, she's done a million things, she's worked with us all these years and she really deserves to be acknowledged. I don't even know if she's here, but if she is, she's listening. <laughs> gift for you that I'll bring tomorrow. <laughs> the other person this year I want to thank is Jeremy Gibson Bond, who has worked with us seven years, I think. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe more. Has had games in the festival, students. He's our chair of education and advancement. He all of a sudden this year decided to launch a whole new program, an educator summit. So um, it's, it's just a pleasure to work with him every single Thank you very much. I mean, you can say something, but thank you. You're, 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 you're all appreciated very much. Um, so most of my, a lot of my work is super fun where I'm trying to get money to run this event. And it is a little bit challenging always. And it's, uh, I was asked recently uh, what our measurable successes were. And it took me, I kind of had to look it up because I'm not actually kind of into those kind of business terms. But um, I, they said, what are your measurable successes? And I sat there for a minute and I said, well, what do you mean? We just want to make a difference. We want to make an impact. Those, that's, that's it. And we want to connect people. Like, and we want to highlight games. Those are our measurable successes to really make a difference moving forward. We are a, 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 a cultural event. We're about arts. We're about celebrating this amazing community of artists and developers. So for us, measurable successes are having each of you here showing games that people can't play elsewhere, that to hopefully have you guys inspire one another, to meet one another, to meet new people, and to be in a space that really is about celebrating what each and every one of you do. Needless to say, I did not get that sponsorship, but I felt really good about what we were doing. <laughs> Um, within that context, though, I do want to really thank the sponsors that do step up and sponsor us because we do get taken for granted. We've been here for 14 years, and I think people think that we will always be here. It does take a lot of people, a lot of effort, a lot of money, a lot of time, and that is deeply appreciated. Um, and I hope that you know all of you do too. So I want to thank Oculus was a presenting sponsor this year. Um, and then we, got, we had really nice support from Kickstarter, from Fandom, from Gamepedia, um, and in particular, and then we have a whole list of other smaller sponsors that are equally important, but it's very meaningful when people 
um, do support us and they should be recognized and supported for doing that. And we really do try and put that, those resources towards some amount of developer assistance, thank you Kickstarter, to, um, to just having fun, um, but being able to pull off the event. So th thank you to everybody. Um, we're trying and making an effort to be a community that can support ourselves as well. A lot of people go on to become successful or to enjoy the community. So we've built a membership program over the last years um, and, uh, and would love everybody to participate in that. But at the very least, our, our alumni program as well. We, it's, the community is really important to us. So I wanna stop taking so much time. I know you guys are very busy, but I want to give a giant round of applause to all of the developers and creators. We couldn't do this without you. So thank you for being the creative souls that you are giving us this pleasure. Um, this, this really is about community. So I've scribbled a few notes on here while I was sitting there. One is that all of the award winners need to take their awards and get their picture taken in front of that um, logo of Indicate. Uh, and you get a little strip. We must have forgotten to tell you to do that before. So please, everybody, get your picture taken with your, with your award. Um, and the other thing is, as a community, we, we invite you to, we're going to go meet at the Brixton pub, which is nearby. So we invite everybody to come and, and join us there. But thank you again, and thank you to everybody that's created this wonderful award show and has worked on this event. And looking forward to a great weekend tomorrow and a short rest of the show. Thank you. Okay, Asher, the night's coming to a close. We're about to announce the Grand Jury Award. Is the script writing machine working? Because darn it, it's now or never. I think I finally cracked it. Uh, the Grand Jury Award. It's grand, mm -hmm. it's big, it deserves the gravitas of history's great speeches, which is exactly what I added to the bot source material. Okay. The 30 most popular speeches. All right, according to, okay. According to some website Just I found. history, all right. O oh, ye immortal gods, the houses of the average man must earn his own master. The Grand Jury Award is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being. This year we saw games with emotional rush, somber introspection, moments of calm. Woe to the effect of the false belief from Providence would have saved them from technology. <laughs> Our trailblazer joins the pantheon of future game makers it touches. One, two, three. It is the Grand Jury Award. Okay. Not bad. Yeah, I mean, the wording was a little off and it was a skosh ominous, but <laughs> the sentiment was there. Yeah. Uh, there, yeah, no lack of gravitas. Right. And that is what the Grand Jury Award deserves. It's meaningful to receive because so many incredible and creative games are represented here at Indicade. Here to present the Grand Jury Award is writer and producer of the games such as King's Quest epi Episodic Series and upcoming Red Lantern from Timberline Studios and partner at indie game fund Kowloon Knights, Lindsay Russell. I don't think I can actually top that bot, so give it so much, you know, gravitas to this moment. So I'm just going to go right off the script here. <laughs> the Indicade Grand Jury Award represents the best of Indicade's best. This is the one game out of tonight's 36 nominees in the hundreds and hundreds of submissions to this year's festival that not only captures how far indie games have come, have come, but how much farther they can still take us. Past winners include Her Story, 1979 Revolution, Black Friday, and last year's Oixipal Book One. I can't say words. <laughs> and to that end, here is the winner for the Grand Jury Award for Indicate 2019. Dicey Dungeons. <laughs> The jury says, Dicey Dungeons reimagines how randomness can be leveraged as a game's central interaction to bring a different experience of traditional content and create pleasurable gaming loops of unexpected variety and feeling. Polished, innovative, and new, Dicey Dungeons is a huge accomplishment. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, this is uh, really genuinely um, a surprise, but means uh, means a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think also, like, thank you to the rest of the team who couldn't be here, um, and everyone who's played the game. Like, such an amazing experience. I could not have asked for more on working with this game and with these people, and this is awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> That is it for the 2019 Indicate Awards. Until tomorrow night at 8 p uh, 9 p.m., actually, when we give away the Choice Awards categories in the same spot, that is. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you, everyone, for joining us from home. And we hope we didn't overstay our welcome. Congratulations to all the winners and to everyone sharing their games with us this weekend. Showing your games is a labor of love, just like making it in the first place. And everyone here at IndieCade and all who attend are grateful for you on both counts. A round of applause for all of our developers. You know, I say it every time, but the projects and people I encounter through this festival fill my tank for the whole year. It's your stunning cleverness and soulfulness that makes this such a rewarding community and medium, even for an actor. Mm -hmm. Uh, truly, though, thank you, Indicate, for an interactive performance award at a time when they seem to be dwindling. But more importantly, thank you to everyone who helped produce and host the festival, not least our incredible sponsors, to Stephanie, Sam, and Celia, our awards production team and lovely presenters and fast food addicted writers. <laughs> Uh, and to Joy Mode for the decor, photo booth, popcorn machine, and giant games. And of course, for the beautiful venue, the SMC Center for Media and Design. Thank you, everybody. Oh, and you can Google how to make your own horse ebooks to figure out how to make your own generated Your own scripts. award show. Your own award show. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, thank you, everyone, everybody. And thank you to our fabulous DJ, Richard LeMarchand. Who will resume, Who DJ. will resume. Yes. All right. Thanks Til so much. Till next year, Til next year you. you guys. Good night. <laughs>